Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, we've got the details you need to know about a critical flaw found in the chip and pin system with some credit cards. Plus, how to do secure backups with rsync, how sharks and squirrels can take down the internet, and then a big batch of your questions. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. This is episode 78, and we streamed it live on October 4th, 2012. This episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible ScaleEngine.com. I think you'll probably hear more about that as we go, too. My name is Chris, and we're joined every single week by by our host, the admin, the professor... And the tech, Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, man. Welcome to episode 78. Yes. Now, uh, we should mention right at the top of the show where we have everybody's attention. Next week, we are filming episode 79 or um, 79 and 80 together, back to back. Yes. So we'll be Except shooting. For backwards as well. But right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's complicated. But so uh, but if yes, you normally so join us live or if you want to get your uh, inputs into the show, you got to do it now. It's like, you're, like the, the clock is running out. Yeah, so if, uh, question, uh, episode 80 will mostly be question-based since it's hard to do a news-based episode a week early. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, questions and comments and feedback and all that uh, for episode 80 needs to be sent in like now. Uh, and yes, so we'll be live two hours early on uh, Thursday next week right. filming episode 80. And then at the regular time, we'll do episode 79. Yep, yep, and uh, of course we've been seeking uh, your submissions for what you wish new hires knew. We have a link for that in the show notes, or you can email it to TechSnap at Jupiter Broadcasting. But you can join this thread. We've got 14 submissions so far in this thread. Let's get a few more before episode 80. Gotta go do it soon! We're also taking your submissions for uh, what might break in the week we're gone. We might take a few funny headlines. We've got a few of those submissions too, and you can find links to those in the show notes. The final days, folks, are approaching. Now, Alan, we've got some great news to get to. Well, I mean, great. Great in the sense that the scope is great and we need to cover it. Then we've got uh, a rocking uh, feedback segment with like five or six emails that we're going to get answered to. We're answering this week. And then we've got a roundup. So before we do all that, I just want to remind folks that these shows are sponsored by you. Primary, the primary con- contributors to Jupiter Broadcasting are our audience. And you can uh, do that uh, without affecting your budget by using our affiliate links at the bottom of our website or by installing the Chrome or Firefox extensions into your web browser. Once you have those bad boys loaded, they'll automatically tag your shopping session wherever you happen to be at if they're an affiliate participator. And uh, you don't even have to think about it. Then you're just shopping, doing your regular business, not impacting your budget, contributing to one of your favorite podcasting networks out there. Maybe your most is favoritist, right? So thank you everyone who does that, especially with the holiday seasons coming up. Please keep our affiliate links in mind. The extension, yes. by the way, has more affiliates than we have listed at the bottom of our website because I, I don't want it to look cluttered down there. I'm anal like that. And then uh, it also has constant improvements. Rika has posted the links up on the, co- the source code up on GitHub, and uh, he's always improving things there, adding additional affiliates that we don't have, improving memory management, taking uh, requests, and things like that. So you can check that out as well. Yep. All right, Alan, should we do our first news story this week? Yes, this is the big one that I promised last week. All right. I've been waiting for here. I've been waiting for it. What is it? Uh, the chip and pin uh, security system used for credit cards, especially in the UK where it was rolled out about 10 years ago, but is uh, become uh, pretty prominent in Canada and is starting to be deployed in the US as well. Uh, there's yet another security flaw found in it by <laughs> some researchers at Cambridge University. Okay. Uh, so the, the chip and pin technology basically replaces your traditional uh, magnetic stripe and signature method for uh, authorizing a credit card, right? So uh, on your credit card, you get this little, what looks like a chip. Now, the chip's actually smaller than that. That's just the, the contacts for it. But yeah. uh, So basically, instead of swiping your card and then signing a little piece of paper to authorize the transaction, uh, you stick your card in the machine, it interfaces with the chip, and you use a PIN number to authorize the transaction. Uh, more like a, a debit card was in Canada, although I think debit cards worked a little different in the States. Okay. But basically, instead of using the magnetic strip, it uses the chip, and uh, the chip does some other stuff on uh, to make sure the card is real, right? Uh, you know, before, you know, merchants would like hold up your card and check for the hologram on the back to make sure it wasn't fake. 
Uh, in this case, the chip does some of the authentication so that the terminal can tell if this has been a clone, if this card's a clone or an original card, and so on. Hmm. Uh, so that, yeah, so the technology uses the chip embedded in the card to authenticate itself to the point of sales terminal or the ATM, uh, and then also to do, handle the uh, PIN. Uh, especially for load value transactions, rather than going all the way back to the bank to check the PIN number. Uh, the PIN number is checked by the chip and then just sends a success or fail type signal to the terminal. Gotcha. Hmm. Uh, so this provides stronger authentication of the card holder. In addition, so in addition to the chip proving to the point of sales terminal that the card isn't a forgery or a clone card, right? Because if we remember a little bit a while back, they were remember they were... Uh, Forging the gift cards, buying ten dollar ones, and then turning them into hundred dollar ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the chip on the card basically prevents that uh, by answering a cryptographic check. Uh, but the other thing it does is provides th- uh, stronger authentication of the card holder. So now that the chip ensures that the card is real, instead of just you signing a piece of paper and the merchant maybe checks your signature versus the one on the back of the card. Mm-hmm which really doesn't provide any uh, extra protection at all. It, uh, instead, you enter a PIN number to verify your identity, which is much more secure, right? Uh, the original idea the banks had behind this was what they called a liability shift. Uh, so basically what they were saying <laughs> was... lovely. <laughs> well, you just wait till you hear what it is. The idea is that fraudulent transactions, <laughs> uh, if the PIN was used would then become the fault of the cardholder. Right? Uh-huh. If, because if somebody entered the PIN, either it was you and you're lying, or you gave away your PIN number. Either way, you don't get your money back from the credit card company. Right. That's probably something they're desperately trying to get away from because that's a huge cost yeah, for them. R- yeah, right now, most times in a fraud instance like that, well, honestly, uh, yeah, sometimes the banks are liable, but a lot of times they just pull the money back from the merchant. Mm, okay. Right? So... If it's an ATM transaction, then yes, the bank has to pay out. Uh, but if it's an in-store transaction, then the, um, the store loses the money rather than the bank. Uh, but the basic idea here was that the bank was trying to shift all the liability off them and onto the customer or the merchant. It says either the merchant didn't have a machine that could check the chip or the user entered the PIN uh, with the chip and they're liable. So the idea was that the banks would then not have to take all these losses. Uh, but the problem is that there's a flaw with the way the chip and pin system works uh, where people were able to run transactions and still create fraud. <laughs> so uh, the liability shift didn't quite kick in the same as they were hoping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, surprise, uh, surprise. Part of the reason was because of an attack discovered in 2010... Uh, where basically by having a fake card connected to a real card, when you run the fake card through your the point of sales terminal or whatever, the fake card falsely reports that it doesn't support a PIN transaction, and then it it goes through. Uh, so it basically it acts as a man in the middle for an attack against the card, where it changes the request coming from the terminal before it gets to the card. Uh. And then the card authorizes it with the chip and sends it back. And basically what it allowed was if you could hide the fact that you're using one card that was wired to a second card, you could then do a PIN transaction and then enter 0000 as the PIN and it would work. (sighs) Uh, And then the bank, the problem was that the bank would go back to the person whose card was stolen and say, well, they used your PIN, so you don't get your money back. But the, even though they weren't actually using the pin, uh, and then the story today is about a new attack that was published. It's called the preplay attack, <laughs> uh, which allows the attacker to determine the information required to authorize the transaction without the pin number uh, ahead of time. So basically, the authentication protocol that's used between the point of sales terminal and the chip on the card mm-hmm. requires the point of sales terminal to generate a announce, which is basically a single-use uh, number, right? It's it basically a 
random number. Uh, it doesn't have to be like cryptographically random. It can be just a regular pseudo random number, but it's important that it's not predictable uh, yeah, okay. mostly. But the general idea is that by including a random number in every transaction, and if someone tries to what's called do a, what's called a replay attack, which is to basically send the already encrypted message a second time, right? So you know you record someone legitimately going to an ATM of drawing $100. You record the transaction that goes to the bank for that. And then if you just replay it a second time, you could get a second hundred dollars. And then you just keep repeating that over <laughs> and over again. Huh. The idea with the nouns is that you, ha you say, all right, we've already seen this number for this transaction. If we see it a second time, it's a duplicate. We don't want to allow that. Uh, but they're, they're not globally unique. They just have to be unique for a, a reasonable period of time to prevent duplicates from happening hmm. right it, so it doesn't have to be really strongly random it just needs to be unpredictable random enough yeah uh so in the documentation for the protocol uh for the chip and pin technology it's documented as the unpredictable number right because it doesn't actually have to be random it just has to be random enough that somebody can't predict what it's going to be at a certain time yeah uh so the purpose is to ensure that the authentication of the card is fresh Right, so an attacker can't use old data to on a new transaction. Okay. Uh, so the problem with the implementation is that many of the point of sales terminals don't actually generate a random or even pseudo random number for the nouns, but just use like a timestamp or a counter. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. So you know the protocol isn't necessarily <laughs> bad; it's just the implementation. Uh, so God. this uh, this allows an attack. <clears throat> Uh, and, and in the logs at your bank, it appears as if your card has been cloned, even though it's supposed to be impossible to clone a card if it has a chip. Uh, right? So the researchers discovered this vulnerability while investigating the case of a specific customer of HSBC, which is a large international bank, mm -hmm. uh, who has refused a refund from his bank, who stated that he must have entered his PIN number at the ATM uh, where the cash was withdrawn, even though that was in a different place than he was. Right? So they, they refused to give him his money back uh, when he was defrauded claiming because he used his PIN number Gosh. or because they used his PIN number that he must have been in on the scheme and he was trying to defraud the bank. You know, Alan, uh, this, is, this is a problem when you have like all these technologies being deployed and you can tell the, it could be just it might not just be like, you know, evil bank being evil, it might just be that the people sitting in the support positions just are so unaware of how any of this works so that when they're not, they're not equipped to, put to, to, you know, identify the issue and then bring it up the yep, chain well, to somebody who could actually fix this problem or analyze and look into this issue. They're just... Yeah, uh, there are... Part of the issue is that even if there was a fix to this problem right now, yeah. it would require replacing a lot of the ATM machines and the point of sales terminals. Right. And the point of sales terminals are mostly owned by the merchants, the stores. And the stores don't want to undertake the cost of replacing all their machines. Uh, you know, and part of the problem is that they may be buying the cheapest machines they can get. I'm sure they are. Uh, and that might be why some of the implementations, like some are better than others, and it seems the weak ones are very common. And they want to keep getting you know, the return on investment on those machines for as long as they possibly can. And exactly. I, just, I just think it's funny because... That's, honestly, that's the main reason why this, the chip system isn't uh, more widely deployed in uh, the U.S. Mm. Is that merchants and banks didn't want to do it. We've, I've seen... Uh, I've and seen you know, in, to force it in the U.K., what they did was they said, all right, at, after this date, if your machine doesn't support chips then any fraud is on you because you didn't upgrade your machine. Is this like the chip that I have like on my American Express? It's like this little, is it, is it the same kind of thing? Or is that? It's like this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like, yeah, yeah, exactly like that. Oh, yeah, right. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's that. So they're starting to be deployed, but they, they basically weren't widely adopted for quite a while. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, so at the behest of the researchers at Cambridge uh, that were contacted by this guy who was basically scammed by his bank. Uh, they asked him to demand from the bank the logs of the transactions in question here. Right? 
And sure. so they sent that data, which I have in the show notes, a little sample of it here. And it shows the date, uh, the time of the transaction, and the supposedly unpredictable number, which the first thing you'll notice is that the first four digits of this hex unpredictable number are the same. Mm-hmm. That's not so unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, so the researchers uh, apparently did some other analysis with it, and I think they had some more data. There's all, The full paper is uh, linked in here, and there's a lot of detail in it. Yeah. Uh, but they determined that, in fact, the first 17 bits of the 32-bit nounce were a fixed value. Uh, it's not clear whether it's fixed to each individual ATM or each brand of ATM or what, but the number of what, you know, so instead of having a 32 bit random number, which is up to 4 billion possibilities, uh, it was only a 15 bit number, uh, which if I remember correctly, is only 32,768 possibilities. Mm. Hmm. I just did that in my head. Did you see that? Did you really? Was that, was that on the fly math? Are you, are you not well, joshing me? I just happen to have memorized all the powers of two. Alan, it's you're not so, actually math in my head. You're so math capable. You're so <laughs> math savvy. It's unbelievable. So That's anyway, why they I have found you do that the time the, stuff. Right, the 15 bit counter that make uh, the 15 bits that make up the rest of the random number. Yeah. Are basically just a counter that is incremented every few milliseconds uh, and rolls over about every three minutes. <laughs> No, mysticism, 16 bits would be 65,536. <laughs> Alan responding to the live chat room there for your yes. audio listeners. Uh, so the research uh, discusses how this weakness could be used to execute a preplay attack. So say you're an uh, employee working at a restaurant or retail store. When someone gives you their credit card, uh, well, with the chip and pin system, you don't so much give the uh, waiter your credit card and they go away and swipe it and come back they bring a portable machine to you and you have to put your card in it and, and enter your PIN number. So it's a little harder. Uh, but basically, if they could gain access, uh, you know, if they controlled the terminal they brought you or whatever, uh, they could basically run a second type of transaction over your card, like a balance check, and uh, try to determine what information they would need to run, to program their own card, basically. Uh, now, that card would only work uh, when the notes came up to be the same thing again. Okay. But that happens once every three minutes on ah, this particular yeah. type of ATM. Sure. Although, it changes every couple of milliseconds, so it would be very hard to time it. But if you read the research paper, they develop, there's a way for the card to ask for more time to compute the randomness or whatever. <laughs> and so basically, you could program a card that would just ask the, the uh, ATM to wait until it was the right time to execute the attack. <laughs> so then if you, could, if you could put your card in within like a 10 second window of when you wanted it, then you could uh, execute this attack. The, uh, so basically, uh, when you use your card legitimately at a restaurant or cafe or whatever, they could possibly skim enough data that at a predetermined time in the future, they could access your card again even though you're not there and you're not entering your pin number the thing that strikes me too is we are very quickly going towards a cashless society I and mean, there's a lot of talk about that but we obviously don't have the right solution in place and even the systems we've been using now for a few years have some pretty f this is fundamental really yes and and you know they're not really designed in a way where you know if we had been if the system was designed properly ahead of time you'd be looking at something where you could remotely upgrade the um, the software right. on one of these these terminals. Something that maybe would be developed today, something more modern. Well, uh, even the more modern ones don't really have that capability, although that's also a security feature, right? If it can't be pre-programmed remotely, it can't be infested with malware remotely. Right, right, yep. Because <laughs> that's, that's one of the places where this attack could really take place, is if you installed malware on a point-of-sales terminal or an ATM or a vending machine that uses cards, then you could have it, you know, record the data uh, off the card and then execute the attack itself. Because what better than the point of sales terminal or the vending machine to allow you to set the unpredictable number for the transaction? Sure. So if you had malware on a vending machine, people walk up, buy something legitimately, oh, yeah. and then, you know, if that machine is networked or something, 
to someone else that has a machine, they could run a transaction somewhere else and get money even though you weren't there and didn't enter your PIN number. Wow. Or, you know, if there's malware on the vending machine, they could record your PIN number, but... I'm, I'm uh, browsing through this PDF you linked in the show notes. There's some good examples yeah. in here. Uh, they show the... Uh, if you look at the picture uh, in, like, chapter 3.1, I think, uh-huh. uh, they show the card that they built. Yes. So in order to uh, figure out how this... Uh, or what these unpredictable numbers are, since, you know, looking at the logs from the bank wasn't a very easy way to do it, uh, they built their own little card with a couple hundred dollars worth of extra processors and stuff on it, uh, but, you know, specifically designed not to become too wide to fit in the slot, in the, uh, the ATMs and so on. Mm-hmm. The researchers built their own special card that would basically record the unpredictable numbers used in each transaction as they performed them. Uh. And then they would just, you know, do a series of, like, check my balance and stuff, stuff that doesn't actually cause a withdrawal from your bank account. The idea there is that, you know, if they did 10 withdrawals in a row at an ATM, it might cause a red flag in the bank's fraud detection system. So instead, they did a bunch of innocuous stuff like checking their balance over and over and over again so that they would see a bunch of these nounce values in, you know, recorded closely together. I'm, you know, in this PDF, they have pictures of them at the, uh, at the ATMs and stuff. Could you imagine their yes. adrenaline? Well, they, they also, to make it easier, they went on eBay and bought a couple of ATMs. <laughs> so that they could tear them apart and see what was inside. Smart, and, smart. Okay. You know, on one of them, they found it was running OS 2. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. And I've seen, I've seen pictures of ones running like Windows 95 or the blue screen of death up and so on. Mm-hmm. And uh, they found that a lot of them just used the RAND uh, function built into C, which is known not to be, you know, cryptographically random at all. That or is actually predictable. That makes a lot of sense. That that's what they would use. But, that. Well, uh, they've also found that sometimes the older ATMs are actually better. Really? Yes, because instead of a uh, general type purpose computer with you know just some code on it, they relied on like a hardware DES chip to do the random numbers. Ah, right. Uh, whereas now, it's mostly just a bunch of software running on any type of simple embedded computer. General purpose processes are fast enough these days. We don't need a dedicated chip. Right. Well, or they're small enough and, and low power enough. Uh, whereas back then, you know, they had no problem. They, they, you know, had purpose-built hardware to do the randomness and so on. Mm-hmm. But uh, they found that some of the newer ones are just, you know, using time and RAND from C and are obviously, therefore, not unpredictable. Wow. Uh, I think they found, like, one of the machines, the random numbers kind of started to repeat every time they rebooted the machine. <laughs> right? Because there wasn't, the random number generator wasn't being properly seeded. And so, you know, in that type of attack, if you could attack the ATM right after it was refilled on a schedule, so when it was first booted up, you could predict what the nounces might be at that time. Yeah, or what if it's like like they have some shots here of these portable ATMs, and these ones you can actually just yank the power cord out of the wall. Yep. Yeah, those are the more port- uh, point of sales type ones. Yeah, yeah, like at the gas stations. And, you and know, there, there's little like wireless ones, like handheld ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with like cell phone style internet, like you know, if I order a pizza, they they can bring the terminal. I can pay with my credit card or debit card at the door. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know. So it'd be fairly easy for my pizza delivery guy to replace the regular terminal with one he built. Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> that, that does some nefarious things. This is a booming opportunity for the delivery guy. Yeah. I like it. I mean, not in the sense that I like it, but in the sense that, you know, everybody yes, needs an opportunity. Uh, so there, there's a paper here and a blog post from one of the authors of the paper that goes into a bunch of detail. And uh, it's quite fascinating to read. But it, it does kind of... Uh, show you that while the system was designed fairly well, although there are some problems, uh, it's more that the implita- Im- implementation was wrong, but also the, the assurance testing, right? Bef- basically, before uh, a vendor that makes one of these machines can sell it with like a Visa logo on it, mm-hmm. it has to undergo testing. Okay. Uh, except for the test is run four transactions one after the other and make sure that you don't get the same random nouns each time. Uh. Well, if if the number you're checking is only four, you're not going to get that anyway. But the other problem was, technically, because of the birthday paradox, 
you're more likely to get two numbers the same in a short run like that from a random number than from a counter or a timer. So it kind of begs the question, you know, was it the testing that caused this to work out wrong? So better testing uh, yes. might have failed some of these devices for not being random enough and a better definition uh, in the specification could have caused people to not think that they shouldn't use a random number because of the chances of two of them being uh, identical near each other. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, Alan, I know now I see why you've, that is a massive story. I see why you've wanted to cover that for a while. Yes, but the PDF file is really long, and I hadn't had time to read it. <laughs> but it's, it's, got, it's got graphs. It's got hardware porn in there. I mean, it's a good PDF. As far yeah, as PDFs it's go. got uh, like printouts from like five or six different ATMs, <laughs> what their yeah. announces look like. Yeah, it got and Tetris running on one point of sales device. They got pictures of that. <laughs> Did you see that in there? Towards the end of the document, they got shots of the thing playing Tetris. It's, yep. I, sh- I showed a quick uh, shot of it on the video stream here, but yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, so any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, but I do recommend if you're interested in it at all that you grab the PDF and uh, read the blog post that I also linked. There you go. There you go. Good good one, Alan. All right. Well, everybody knows that uh, nobody enjoys strong hash like NIST, so we've got a uh, hash update here, don't we, Alan? <laughs> NIST, which is the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology or something like that, I forget. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, they've they have, as we talked about a little bit last week, they held a competition to decide which algorithm would be SHA-3, which is the standard hashing algorithm version 3. Uh, and that's why they, they're they in charge of choosing the standard encryption and hashing algorithms used by the government and recommended for other people. Uh, so they've made their choice uh, for what SHA-3 will be. It's an algorithm called Kachak. Ooh. Uh, it was designed by a bunch of researchers a from... A Klingon scientist? <laughs> ST Microelectronics and NXP Semiconductors. Okay. And is basically one of 63 different entrants into the competition. Uh, so the competition started in 2007 uh, when it looked like there might be some issues with SHA v2. Uh, specifically, there were some types of cryptanalysis that were looking like it might actually lead to... Uh, the type of attacks we see against MD5, but mm. against SHA, like 256 and 512. Okay. Uh, but those issues never ended up actually surfacing. Uh, so SSA 2 is still considered secure, but it wasn't looking good in 2007, so they started the competition. And now the, the competition is over, and they've picked what SHA 3 is going to be. Okay. Uh, because Kachak, or Kachak is not a derivative of SHA 2. Kachak! It, right, it's not just more bits yeah. or a slight change to the algorithm. It's entirely different. Yeah, uh, it means that an attack that does eventually work against SSA two would not would be very unlikely that it would also work against SSA three. So there's some value in having it, even though SSA two isn't ready to be deprecated yet. Yeah, for sure. And since you know it'll probably take a few years before it's a built-in support for it is in all the crypto libraries and everything that people use. It's good probably to have it, you know, come out sooner, like mm-hmm. before it's needed. Because, you know, if it's not available until it's needed, right, if they held off the competition until SHA 2 was proven vulnerable, then, you know, it might take a while before everybody be able to use the new one. So by having it out early, it means that we can, it'll, you know, support for it will be built into like newer versions of OpenSSL Stuff or. Stuff will just start rolling out over time yeah. with it just baked in. Yeah. Uh, although it may not be the default uh, at first. Okay, yeah, sure. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, there are some, uh, a couple of concerns about it, mostly that it is, as far as I've read, it's actually faster than SHA-2. And it, on specially designed hardware, it's able to be accelerated even more. Oh. Uh, which can be a good thing, right? Because... In, in regular use where you're trying to hash something, you want that to be as fast as possible. Right. Uh, especially if you're going to use it for you know, signatures or if you're doing encryption or whatever. Uh, but for password hashing, being fast is a downside, not an upside. I was, yeah, right? okay. 
even for SHA two, we normally combat that by doing it ten thousand times. Mm -hmm. uh, so SHA three may not be a good choice for password hashing. Okay, but we do have things like bcrypt and you know SHA two, uh, where we do like SHA five twelve crypt, which isn't just regular SHA five twelve. It's a modified version specifically designed for passwords, which involves doing many rounds and also having a salt and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it does seem that maybe SHA-3 will purposely be avoided for using uh, their password hashing because it's even faster. That's interesting. That's interesting. So uh, what? Well, uh, but, uh, you know, if it, it's more used to have a fast hashing algorithm than to have another password, another yeah. slow password hashing. That's kind of what I was wondering, if that's what you thought, because it seems like that yeah, we, we definitely... Basically, we shouldn't be trying to use... The, maybe we shouldn't be using one algorithm for both things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, it's cool that they had a competition, too. That's kind of a neat well, way that's, to... Well, that's how SHA-1 and, and SHA-2 were decided as well. I love that. I mean, don't you think also, that's sort uh, of... Yep. Well, it's the proper way to do it. Also, um, AES, the main encryption, like symmetric encryption that we use, that is a NIST-defined standard, right? The algorithm is actually called Regendal. Or something. I don't, it's hard to pronounce because it's like okay. R and then a J, and it's like that doesn't happen in English. I was just uh, skimming the article. I was trying to see what did they get for being the competition winner. Um, it, it I, says it beat out sixty-three other submissions. Yeah, uh, but, but it doesn't say what they got. I don't think you get anything. Maybe you just get the prestige of having. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe. Uh, okay. But yeah, so like DES was the data encryption standard, and when that wasn't good enough anymore, the NIST had a competition. And picked from a number of different algorithms, including like Blowfish, Two Fish, and Virgindal, to choose AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, and that's what we use now. And then they did the same thing to replace MD5 with SHA1 and then SHA2, uh, and now SHA3. There you go. Hmm. Uh, now, why don't we take a quick break here, and this be a good opportunity to say thank you to our sponsor this week, GoDaddy.com. They've got a couple of good deals for us. And, you know, I think I'll tell you a story. So GoDaddy.com, the world's number one domain name registrar. You probably know that. They're the golden standard in this. And the thing that I love about GoDaddy is if you buy a domain there to today... When you come back and say two years, because you, you know you buy it with a couple year renewals, you come back because they are like the gold standard. They're the world's largest. They're still there. Your login still works. You still get access to all of your other stuff you have logged in there. It's not one of these weird things where it's a one off domain name registrar that's around right now. And it's with this in mind, Alan, that I have decided this might be a little geeky. But tomorrow is my mom's birthday, and she does a lot of different art stuff, where she does uh, computer-generated art and Photoshop and a bunch of different tools, and then puts it out on the web for demonstration to, to get featured in local uh, restaurants and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy mom a, a domain where she can feature this stuff. If you go over to GoDaddy.com right now and check it out. Now, don't tell mom this, and I'm, I'm pretty sure mom doesn't listen to TechSnap. It's not... <laughs> quite her thing. Uh, but I can get mom an easy, cheap domain for if for just $5.99 freaking cents. $5.99 if you That's use our code. Cheap. I know. I know. And I'm not trying to be a cheap son, but you know, budgets are tight this year. $5.99 tech. Boom. You put that in when you check out, you get the dot .com for $5.99. But honestly, honestly, here's what I'm going to do. Just as the complete package for mom, I'm going to give her a WordPress site because it needs to be something that's easy for her to manage and she can just go there. It has a nice gooey, you know, uh, front end to write the post. Yep. And GoDaddy makes it crazy easy to do this. And we've got a, we've got an extra bonus code that they're running because people have been loving this one so they've extended it just for us. Now, it does end at the end of this month, but if you want to get 25% off anything you're doing, you're doing a renewal, you're doing a server hosting, whatever it might be, you use the code ready for this go20 off 5. Go20 off 5 gets you 20% off. Anything you're getting at GoDaddy. So I'm doing the whole shebang. I'm going to use the code GO20 off 5. I'm going to get a, a little uh, server that I, I'll, I'll throw stuff on. You know, you can throw like several different sites on these servers. So yep. I'll throw mom's site on there. I'm going to throw one of Angela's websites on there. Use the code GO20 off 5. I'm saving 20%. One button push for WordPress. I throw a nice theme on there. They've actually got a theme gallery. It's super easy. And WordPress makes this ridiculously simple now. And you combine that with GoDaddy's one button publishing system for any of those types of apps. And, I mean, you're talking 20 minutes. You've got a complete site set up, and if you use our codes, you support the show, you save yourself some money, and boom, Bob's your uncle. Now, maybe you're not getting a site for mom. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. But whatever it might be, we've got two codes for you. So that's uh, code 599TECH to save uh, money when you're buying a .com. You get a .com for $5.99. 
or you just want to take 20% off the top. You want to cut the rate. You want to cut rates 20%. Just cut them right off the top. Use our code GO20 off 5. And thank you to GoDaddy for sponsoring this week's episode of the TechSnap program. And happy birthday, Mom. Not that you watch this. And hopefully if you do watch this for some strange reason, you watch it after your birthday tomorrow and you will still be surprised when you get an email with your website all set up. Hopefully. Yep. <laughs> I don't think um, the the one possibility is she actually is in the car with Angela right now, and they might be streaming on the <laughs> Jupiter radio station. So, hi, mom, happy birthday! <laughs> all right, Alan. Well, I think that's all the news we have for the top of the show, which means it's time for the tech snap feedback. Well, thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or clicking that contact link at the top of our site or submitting your question to our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. In fact, Alan, that's where our first question comes from this week. Are you ready for the first question, sir? Yes, yes. All right. Sent in here by Soapster. I love that. I, I, I just love that one. Uh, he says, I need help finding the correct chat server. I need to set up a private and secure chat room server, hopefully on Windows. Yes, I know, but I don't have any more computers run Linux on. Uh, I need to be able to forward the port so outside internet users could connect, specifically my coworkers, and it must be secure, at least a minimal, at minimal, SSL secure. Uh, self-signed cert is okay and preferred, actually. Mm -hmm. I looked into IRC, but I got overwhelmed fast. It's a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. I've set up LAMP servers, Vent, TeamSpeak, and Mumble servers with uh, really no difficulty. But that looked complicated, I guess. Any ideas, yeah. Alan, for a chat server to be secure? Uh, there's a couple choices there. Um, there's, if you want to go more like chat and instant messaging, there's XMPP, which used to be called Jabber. It's the protocol that Google Talk uses, that Facebook uses, and you, you know, clients. It's built into a lot of chat clients like um, Pigeon and, and oh yeah, so on. It's every so, yeah. chat client. Yeah, so XMPP is a, a good choice. Uh, you can run a private server or a federated server. Uh, right, like Google Talks, a federated server. Basically, any other XMPP server can communicate through it. So, you know, you can have your own private, you know, yourdomain.com XMPP server. And then on your friends list there, you can add people from external servers because it's federated. Yeah. Or you can block that and have your server be internal only. Yeah. That's uh, absolutely so, the way to go right there, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's probably... Uh, good choice. For Although, Windows... Uh, the server is, is not out of the question. Uh you know, I, I admit they're not that easy to set up, although, you know, I learned how to do it when I was 13. <laughs> For Windows, he should look into OpenFire, which is a really easy to set up XMPP server uh, that runs on top of Windows and any XMPP client can connect to it. This even does, like, since he's a, it sounds like he's a Windows shop, this even does Active Directory tie-in if you have a few extensions to your AD. I mean, this is, that's a good way to go. Yep. Uh, but yeah, there, there are ports of a bunch of popular IRC servers to Windows so that you can run them on Windows. Uh, and there are some guides you can find on how to do that. Uh, a friend of mine wrote a really good one, but its website isn't up anymore. He let it expire. Womp womp. See? See? He yeah. should go over to GoDaddy and use our code go 20 off 5 and get 20% off and renew that sucker. Yep. <laughs> I think the problem is that he lost the hard drive that had the oh, post on it. Oh, man. Back your stuff up, Phil. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't mean but yeah, uh, so yeah, IRC is not out of the question. Um, it is a bit of a learning curve, but if you use IRC a lot, you might be able to handle it. Um, yeah, I'd say so. It, it was like the first server I ever learned how to run. <laughs> well, you could give a plug for Geek Shed too. I mean, Geek Shed can be trusted. Yeah. Yeah, although if he wants it entirely private so that there's right. no one other than the employees at his company on it, then something like XMPP is probably the easiest. Yeah, yeah. But I have dirty but, chats yes. on Geek Chat all the time. I don't think about his watch. I mean, dirty. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I just tried to freak Alan out. <laughs> all right. Well, as long as uh, I don't have to see it, I'm perfectly okay with whatever you want to do. That's a good question from Soapster. And if anybody has uh, any suggestions, this will, this uh, thread is linked in the show notes if there's one you love. Uh, Wireshot uh, put a x7chat.com in there. And uh, TechSnap, with a couple of Ps, put uh, procity.im in there. So you can go check those out too. And if you have any other suggestions and you want him to know about it, you can find a link to that thread in the show notes. Next question, Alan? Sure. Okay, this next one is uh, more of an FYI, really. It came uh, it was as a follow-up to a d conversation we had in last week's episode from Splinter701. He says, the Nexus S does have NFC. It was one of the first, if not the first, to incorporate that technology. If 
like me, you are worried about the security issues associated with NFC, then you can easily disable it in the Android's settings menu. However, for those of you not satisfied with that, you can disable it. Uh, you can disable the hardware, and I wonder if this is true, by sticking some electrical tape over the NFC terminals under the back cover of your phone, the upper right on the Nexus S. Uh, so uh, he says, stay safe, everyone. Love the show. Chris and Alan, you guys rock. Then uh, uh, Mixstep asked, how on earth is sticking electrical tape over the NFC terminals going to disable them? Which Splinter then responded saying the terminals themselves don't, use, uh, don't do any wireless transmission. They connect to a very thin chip that's built in the back of the cover, which does the wireless transmission. Right. So he's not saying put electrical tape over the back of your phone. He's saying right. put it between the two metal contacts, contacts that connect yeah. the chip to the antenna. And Are you worried? Does that feel like? Is that something you feel like you need um, to do? Not really, because you it's know it's off in settings, f- right? And yeah, and you know my phone's on my belt. I don't, I don't leave my phone laying around on tables, and I don't wave it around. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not Mr. NFC. In fact, I'm, I'm not even so sure it is the right solution, especially with some right, of the- especially since it's based on the same protocol that we just talked about earlier in the show. Right. There's actually a little bit about that in the doc about how it's a different version of it but it's basically the same problems imply to not just like the nfc on your phone but like uh pay wave and um i forget what the other one's called and then there's an amex version too the uh pay pass the, Visa uh, is pay pass and mastercard is pay wave and okay. then okay. i forget what the american express one's called the uh the twit network you know they have their security now podcast Yep. And they just did episode 372 on uh, on NFC. And Gibson goes on to talk about how he thinks, you know, one of the fundamental issues with the implementation on uh, on Android is uh, at, at the implementation level, it works without requiring confirmation from the user. So it's able to execute actions without user right. acceptance. Whereas if it, if it, you know, did a pop-up and you had to say yes uh, and maybe specifically have to unlock your phone first and then say yes... Then that, but of course, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of the NFC of, of speeding up the transaction. Yeah. Because uh, then it becomes no faster than slipping a card in the machine and typing in a PIN number. But does it need to be any faster than that? Mm. Or maybe, maybe it doesn't work so well for NFC. Be- yeah, basically, NFC needs to be locked down in some way so that you control what it has access to. Yeah. And, you know, maybe a confirmation button or. You know, you could a setting saying if the value of the transaction is under X dollars, then confirm it automatically. But if it's more than five dollars, then I have to hit OK. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. Sort of like how with debit cards, sometimes you don't have to sign unless the transaction's over a certain amount. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Canada, you never sign with a debit card. You always had a pin yeah. that's actually verified over the internet to the bank, not just. Locally, oh, the internet. Now, is this new? I'm not familiar with uh, this. Well, yeah, it just before the the terminal would dial up to the bank, and right. it made it take a little yeah. while. Yeah, because I know, remember and that. You hear the modem squeal every time somebody oh, wanted yeah. to use the oh, yeah. debit card. Yeah, and, um, you know, in fact, I, I still run into that store. sometimes. It, it's, it interferes with the store's phone line too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're always like, "Oh, sorry, the credit card machine isn't working right now." Someone, so and so's Susie's on the phone again. Susie's on the phone. <laughs> Uh, should we go to John's email? Yep. John writes in with a few uh, interesting tidbits about R-Sync. I have a sense, Alan, you might have heard of these ones before. John writes, uh, Alan and Chris, first off, thanks for the show. Started watching after seeing Alan on the Linux Action Show. I'm currently going through the entire set of TechSnap episodes while I grade assignments. Love it. Uh, the level of research, technical detail, and solid analysis is always appreciated. Well, thank you very mm-hmm. much, John. Uh, he says, I'm currently watching episode 26, Ultimate Backups, and this has prompted a question. My question is on R-Sync and backups, particularly Alan's often repeated point that R-Sync is not really a backup since you only have one copy. And of course he agrees, one copy is not a backup. Uh, I use R-Sync to backup my home directory to an external USB drive at the end of each day and have been hit once or twice by this very issue. So Alan's point hit home and I started looking for solutions. Interestingly enough, the solution I found was R-Sync. It turns out that R-Sync has an option, dash dash link dash dest, and then you give it the destination. Let's you specify a directory uh, that will compare the source directory to and for files that haven't changed, it will hard link those files to the source directory. For example, you could do rsync-a and say your home folder and then 
the path to the destination. That would make uh, a full backup of your home folder. The yep. next time you run that same backup, if you did rsync dash a and added dash dash link dash dest and gave it the link to where your backup's going to be, then gave it the path to your home folder, and then gave it the link to a second spot where you want a second copy of the backups, any files in your home folder that have not changed since the full backup are just hard linked from the second backup to the full backup folder. Files that have changes are copied to second backup as usual. I'm sure you're aware you could use the date command to make a script that uh, runs cr a cron job each day. Then go back to any day's backup. Uh, you just need to restore the backups folder rather than the full, then the differentials, and then the incrementals. But his question is this, Alan. Does this solve the issue with rsync only creating one copy, at least for a backup, as a, uh, you know, for like a desktop on a daily basis? It seems um, like it would be... Partly, uh, yes. No, uh, so yes, it, it does... That solves the main thing is where you want to have more than one copy of every file. Uh, specifically, not just more than one copy, right? Because otherwise you just tell rsync to copy the whole directory to three different directories. Yeah. You need basically multiple points in time that you can back up to because if you break a file at the end of the day, don't realize it, back up your stick at the end of the day, go home, come back the next day, now your original and your backup are both a corrupt copy. Right. Whereas if you use this scheme where you would have um, a different directory for every day and it would basically deduplicate the files by hard linking, right? So if the file's the same today as it was yesterday, today's copy is just a hard link to the original copy or to the very first backup. Uh, that way, you don't end up using your whole amount of space every day. Uh, one downside to this is if it's a file that grows incrementally, like a log file or something, that file is going to get copied the whole thing every time, right? rsync can't use just its differential uh, algorithm to copy only the change part of the file. It's mm. going to back up the whole file, okay. uh, which is fine, but after some time, it might add up. The main downside to using just rsync to a USB stick like that is that you have nothing cleaning up old copies of the files, right? Uh, and Yeah, which can no, be you good. Could, you could script that as well. Uh, you could you know, do a fine command and say anything older than yeah. X days gets deleted. And because it's a hard link, as long as one of the directory still links to that file, the data is still there. Uh, but you know, basically, the problem you could run into is that eventually your USB stick might get full. And you know, if you don't notice that error, then you have a problem. Whereas a more robust backup system might be able to do something better about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, yes, that there would turn rsync from just making a copy into actually making you snapshot type uh, backups. Well, and what's interesting is what he's, what he's put together here is what, in a large part, <clears throat> what Apple's time machine built into Mac OS X does, and it, it, it does rsync and hard links, and uh, what backup PC does, which is completely rsync driven, um, which, and is a really well-known open source uh, backup system that works great for desktop backups. Uh, so he's kind yeah, of so basically rsync is is handling a bit of deduplication here, although it's file based, not block based. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, if you if you had your backup to something that had block level deduplication, then when you had files that only changed partly, mm -hmm. the first bunch of blocks would stay the same, and those would be deduplicated. Uh, so yeah. yeah. But uh, in general, yes, that's that makes it good enough. And what's cool it about it is... passes the bar from not good enough to good enough. I mean, he's, he's using it for his home machine, right? But, but it, it actually, this type of functionality is great at a larger enterprise scale because you have, like, half your users have the same docs in their home folder. Like, it's the change form or it's now, the you uh, know, request form. Now, on some stuff, rsync compares files based on the size and the date stamp. Mm -hmm. If they have m different date stamps on the file, but the contents are the same, unless you enable right. checksum only mode in rsync, you're going to end up with multiple copies and you're not going to have the deduplication. Right, yeah. The date For yeah, enterprise the date type solution, have to what you'd normally have is backing it all up to something like ZFS that does block level deduplication on everything. Not all of us have ZFS, Alan. So we we we, we make well, these crazy R sync scripts. I know, I know, I know. Uh, I know. I but know. Um, another option is if you have something like Bacula, Bacula has what's called base level backups. Like normally you have your full, your differential and your incremental, mm -hmm. but a base level backup is basically you target the files that are common across all your machines. Right, like so operating base, system files? Yeah, so you, you do a base level backup of the operating system 
and then that fo- those files get included even from the full. I like that. And you only have to do the base once, or maybe once for each different service pack or whatever. Yeah, Bacula is now a little overkill for a desktop, though. Yes. Ah, yeah. And so yes, rsync with the hard links is a good solution. Although you might want to have more than one USB stick that you're doing this to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I'm trying to get. I got to get a client to switch over to Bacula. You know, and every, you know, I love Bacula. It's one of my favorite backup solutions. Uh, speaking of uh, flash drives, this next question fits right into that. Should I go to that? Sure. All right. Julian writes in, looking for an easy way to encrypt on the go. He says, I was wondering if there is a way to easily encrypt personal files on the go. And I know there's a few different ways I can do this. So my case is, my use case is this. I've got various flash drives that I carry around with me all the time. But I have both personal and public data I want to store on them. So a few basic questions. Should I encrypt the whole partition on the flash drives or just encrypt certain directories and files? Which method would cause less portability problems, as in opening the drive on different OSs, mainly Linux, Windows, and Mac? And I've heard that different partitions could be problematic. Although less relevant, what software do you recommend? Google tells me that TrueCrypt seems like a common choice. And Mm -hmm. the fourth question, which is the last one, if partitions... I've heard it makes sense to only have smaller partitions for private encrypted files. These aren't, uh, pri- these aren't the private multimedia type files, if you know what it means. Since there is performance overhead when encrypting and decrypting. It would be awesome to hear your take on flash drive encryptions uh, and, and hygiene about flash drives. Uh, and how to, make a simple, uh, how to make it simple, since it seems the common problem for many is uh, it's too complicated. And uh, flash drives are quite easy to lose, so he wants them protected. He's an avid viewer of LAS and TechSnap. Thanks, okay. Um, yeah, probably the easiest way is TrueCrypt, and rather than partitioning it, you would leave your USB stick like normal, and basically you have a, an encrypted volume, which basically just a file sits on the flash drive and contains all the encrypted stuff. This way, the um, space that's available, you never end up with free space fragmentation where there's some free space in the encrypted partition and some free space on the not encrypted partition but not enough space on either to fit the file you're trying to fit. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, the advantage with having at least part of the drive not encrypted is you can put the installer for TrueCrypt Windows, TrueCrypt Mac, and TrueCrypt Linux on the unencrypted partition so that whatever machine you sit down at, you can install the TrueCrypt program on so that you can access the encrypted part. And then probably if you switch in between Windows, Mac, and Linux, the most common file system that all three can read and write to is FAT32. Yes, although there's a limit of four gigabytes to yeah. a single file, yeah. which may pose a problem if you're trying to store a larger encrypted volume. So you might although, need to do like several, you know, TrueCrypt yeah, files. Yeah, although, uh, I don't know, can TrueCrypt uh, span files like that? Or would yeah. you have to do separate encrypted volumes? I, I think when you're creating the volume, you can tell it to split the file at every certain size, I think. That sounds Gosh. like that sounds very reasonable because yeah, you definitely probably want to have FAT32. Although FAT32 does have some downsides as far as consistency and mm. you know surviving from you yanking out the USB stick while it was writing. Right, especially with uh, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Uh. Th- yeah. There's some problems with partitioning USB sticks where some OSs don't like to pick it up, although a lot will. Um. So yeah, it's kind of a compatibility level thing. The advantage with a partition over a file is it's harder for someone to purposely or accidentally just delete the file off your USB stick, right? If you leave your USB stick in a computer, in a computer lab at college or something, and you step away for a second, someone can delete the encrypted volume and there goes all your encrypted data, yeah. which generally is better than them getting access to what was on the encrypt- in the encrypted file, right? Usually you'd rather lose it than let it fall into enemy hands, as it were. <laughs> Right. And TrueCrypt is worth looking into because, A, it's going to have all three operating systems covered. It's common. And the reason why it's so common is because it's well-trusted. and yep. it Because it's open source, so it can be audited. Yeah. And it has some ways you can do hidden TrueCrypt volumes and things like that. Yes, so. like plausible deniability and so on. Yeah, that's um, cool stuff. But yeah the, yeah, the main things with TrueCrypt are that it is open source uh, and cross-platform. But the open source part is important because it means that it's been audited, right? Somebody can look over the source and make sure it's not doing something it's not supposed to. Right. Another thing to look for if you're looking at any other solution is if they offer some kind of recovery option where you can get back your files if you lost your password, it's not secure. 
right? The, the downside to strong encryption is that if you lose the password, there's no way to get the files back. Right. That's the whole point. Yeah. 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 Great point. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Um, uh, other options are you could do something like GPG, although those are, if you're doing full asymmetric encryption, that's much slower. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, there are command line GPG apps for Windows and Linux and Mac, but yeah, TrueCrypt really seems like the best option there. Yeah. I agree. All right. And uh, good luck. Let us know how it goes. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, just a couple more, actually, the, the last two here. And uh, this one comes from Eric. And Eric writes, uh, and I think Eric, I like this. Eric's like thinking outside the box on this one, Alan. He says, uh, why do banks use passwords at all? And uh, he says, hi, Chris and Alan. Now, some episodes ago, you talked about the length of your bank passwords and how they were restricted to a certain length. I was wondering why banks in North America opt to have passwords at all. Here in Sweden, all major banks, as far as he can tell, have DigiPass which is either a car reader or a keypad. So when I sign into my bank account, and I have the KeyFab one, I get two sets of four-digit numbers from my bank, and then I enter those into my DigiPass, which, is, uh, which will then present, present me with a six-digit number as, one, as a one-time password. This seems far more secure because the DigiPass is personal, and it's only a one-time password. Do you know if this is in the uh, wide use in North America? And if not, why not? Uh, I was somewhat shocked when I heard about your banks restricting password, password lengths. <laughs> and you should expect banks to take security quite seriously. Best regards, Eric. So uh, are you familiar with this system? Um, not exactly, but if it's just a one-time password, like the key fobs I have from like PayPal or, yeah. or anything like that, if it's only that, that's not very secure because it means if someone stole your key fob, which maybe is attached to your keychain, they would have access to your bank account. Hmm. Right, it makes sense as a multi-factor authentication, like a password and the fob. But uh, so he's got like he actually is, uh, more of a smart card. So basically, there's a uh, USB component where your browser is actually interfacing with a smart card to encrypt or authenticate data. Yeah, and then the one, the the um, the random number, the the nouns generator. Yeah. Um, He's also got another option they have is where the bank gives him an, uh, a series of numbers and then he's got a keypad and he has to enter those numbers into it and then it comes back with a result and then he enters that result into the website. Right. Yeah, so that's like an offline version of the key fob. Yeah. Uh, of the, yeah. Sorry, of the smart card, not the key fob. Right. So, yeah, you're, uh, when you have a smart card, the computer's doing that process so you don't have to manually key in the numbers. But for, in some instances, you know, one of the questions would be with any solution from your bank that's like a USB stick or something, is it going to work with my Linux box? Oh, no, it doesn't. Why? Right, right, right. I think the main reason is that the banks don't want to provide technical support for people that use their computers. Because, <laughs> you know, if there's anything I've ever noticed, it's that some older people with their computers trying to do their banking would make you cry. <laughs> okay, that's true. Yeah, I don't blame the banks for that one. I don't yeah, blame them. You can understand why they want to provide as little technical support as humanly possible. Yeah. Yeah, because you know your bank doesn't want to have to deal with the fact that you don't know how to use your web browser, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, all right. Should we do the next email? This one. Yes, it would be better if you know you had to have a password and a smart card. Yeah. Why the banks aren't doing it? I guess was really this question. <sighs> Part what, of it maybe that just consumers don't demand it, or consumers would actually find it an inconvenience. I wonder if his if their banks are state run. I don't. I don't know. Maybe too could be that there's just no commercial pressure to get it done i don't know now alan don't worry though because uh this next email you're off the hook i have to answer it so mm -hmm. uh, here we go uh, it comes in from kevin and he wants to know he says hey guys is there any way to get TechSnap on the stitcher.com podcast directory it's the only podcast that i cannot find i listen to the linux action show on stitcher without issues it'd be great if i could add TechSnap as well thanks for all your hard work and time putting into these shows take care so stitcher we uh we have our all we have the linux action show in stitcher and then we have our all shows feed in, in Stitcher. So you can get all the Jupiter Broadcasting shows. That's it. Kevin, your email inspired me. And I just submitted uh, Coder Radio, TechSnap, Unfilter, Faux Show, Cybite, all independently into Stitcher. I just submitted them this morning. So hopefully over the next couple of days, they'll approve those. And you'll be able to search the Stitcher app. And uh, if you're not familiar with Stitcher, Alan, have you ever tried it? Nope. 
So it's like radio for podcasts. You load this app, you tell it what category you want. You can get kind of fine. You can go into, you could do technology, or you can do like technology Linux, technology security, right? And right. then it will uh, automatically generate uh, from from different cat from the feeds that people have submitted, basically, basically like a continuing playlist of podcasts of that genre. And so uh, fans of like Linux podcasts will just go in there and type Linux, and they can hear some of the other guys' podcasts. They hear the Linux Action Show. You know, they hear Sunday Morning Review, Mittencast. All that's in there, and they just sit back and, and stream it. And so uh, I could totally, I could totally see why you'd want TechSnap and Coda Radio and all those in that mix. So those hopefully will be in there very soon in the Stitcher directory. And uh, I have a link to that if you want to get the all shows feed. If you just say, "Ah, screw it, I just want all the shows," a link to that for Stitcher is in this week's show notes. So there you go. Yes. All right, Alan. That's uh, that's all the emails we got for this week. Now, don't forget, folks. We need a whole bunch more because we got to fill episode seventy nine and eighty next week. So yep. email those into any system admin related question. Anything you got you think fits for the show? TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting dot com. It's probably one of your best chances to get it onto the show if you've ever sent something in before that maybe didn't make it. Also, we have links in the show notes where you can submit in that thread for what broke the week that we took off. Obviously, these should just be funny stories. And then also any uh, things you wish that new hires knew that came into your field. You're a sysadmin, you're a developer, whatever you might be. If you wish the new guys coming in had a better idea about a few topics, submit those ideas in that thread or email them to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting dot com, and we'll be covering those. Uh, very soon. That's the last time I have to ask for that. We've been asking for a long time, but this will be the last episode we ask because after this, uh, it's done. So there you go. All right, Alan. Well, that's all the feedback for this week, so I believe that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. And welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite make it to the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them, maybe give you links to follow up on your own a little later. Keep them on your radar. The links are almost exclusively provided by our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And this week, Alan, we've got a good batch. Are you ready for the first one? Yep. All right, so this one is another uh, Microsoft Ninja action. Working with regulators, the FTC announces a crackdown on massive international computer tech support scam that allegedly swindled tens of thousands of consumers in six countries. And uh, remember, we actually talked about Microsoft shutting down a botnet. Well, in this case, they're actually shutting down like a... like a tech support ring where people would uh, search on Google for tech support and they would buy ads on Google ads for, you know, call us to get tech support. And then people would call them to get tech support and they'd be like, oh, yeah, well, we're not from India. Here, let us get on your PC. We'll work on your machine for you. Well, and they, uh, the more nefarious version was where they called you. Yes. Uh, my dad got some calls like this where, yeah, they basically would call up, uh, for example, my dad. And be like, hi, we're from Microsoft, yes. and your computer is sending out bad viruses to other people. And you should let us, you should follow these instructions and download TeamViewer and let us take over your machine so that we can fix it for you. So here's an example of a transcript. It says uh, the FTC agent calls in, says, Hello, I have a warning on my screen. And the defendant says, Madam, it would be my humble request to you. Please do not try to click on any of them, okay? And then they say, Okay. And it would be my request to you that you keep your mouse pointed away from them because they are malicious online infections I was speaking about. Once you click any of them, your computer might even stop responding at any point. And so be very careful, okay? And then he goes through this process of getting on her machine, proclaiming to have discovered malware that they know doesn't exist because this is a controlled test, right? Yep. And then charging, and they found in ranges anywhere from $50 to $400 to remove malware that wasn't even real. Just yeah, taking and advantage most likely of not actually solving the problem the person called about. Right, the original problem that got them searching. CNET and a bunch of other places did a write up on it. They said there's been more than ten thousand complaints in Australia since two thousand nine. Then Australian uh, com- uh, Communications and Media Authority contacted U.S. authorities, which had received about twenty four hundred complaints. Uh, but then the FTC has said hundreds of thousands of U.S. consumers could have been affected and. Uh, the FTC also acknowledged that uh, the investigated investigation was assisted by Microsoft as well as other technology companies. Microsoft's direct consumer of affairs said that uh, that uh, Microsoft will continue to work with agencies as other scams emerge. Well, yes, because Microsoft wants people to call Microsoft and pay the like so the one time call fee is like seventy dollars or something. I forget how much Microsoft charge. It's cutting in on their business. You're saying. I forget how much Microsoft charges if, if you don't have a support contract and you just call up and want help with something, but it's, it's quite a bit. And uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, people need to uh, do, be a little more careful. You know, when you search something on the Internet and you 
find something, you might better make sure it's legit before you start giving them your credit card and so on. By the way, Alan, happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I don't know if you knew this, but October kicked off Cybersecurity Awareness a month in the United States. And, uh, now, who, who decided that October was Cybersecurity Awareness Month? Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, which, which by the way... It's trying to run through all these ridiculous cybersecurity laws. Yes, if, if the executive order passes that uh, is uh, already been drafted, uh, it would put cybersecurity within the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security, which <laughs> the uh, person who runs the Department of Homeland Security admits to not using computers or email. So um, that'll be great. But uh, not to be out to, and by the way, this is a topic we're going to talk a lot about on Unfiltered Night. I got clips of the whole, th- of all of the stuff they're trying to do. The cybersecurity stuff is such a big push right now, Alan. And it's interesting too, because we're seeing here in, uh, in the roundup, Britain and, uh, and uh, Britain in talks on cybersecurity hotline with China and Russia. Yes, they say so- the existing protocols aren't robust enough for emergencies. Right. So if you remember the, the concept of the hotline from yes. you know, bad 80s movies and so on, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yes. <laughs> the idea was that it was a direct line of communications between the heads of states of like the uh, well, U.S. and um, the Soviet Union. Right. Uh, so they could talk each other down before they started firing nukes at each other or something. <laughs> uh, so the idea here is some system like that uh, for, I'm guessing, the telecommunication agencies of Britain, China, and Russia to talk to each other about emerging cybersecurity threats and maybe even actions against each other in order to try to calm things down and prevent. It's uh, interesting the U.S. isn't in that list. In well, fact... Well, uh, separately, the U.S. has been negotiating the same type of thing with China. Yes. Uh, but they haven't but, been going well, I guess. The talks have not right, been very productive. Uh, but there is a international conference on cybersecurity in Hungary today uh, that involves about 600 diplomats from 50 different countries that are uh, trying to negotiate some kind of yeah. rules of behavior in cyberspace for governments. Right. And, of course, different governments have different, uh, different levels of commitment to an open Internet, and they have uh, different right. ideas or about how to fix things. Specifically, uh, China and Russia have been arguing for more restrictive state-controlled future of the Internet and formal arms control-type treaties governing what countries can and cannot do on the Internet. So this Part is of the inter- problem here is... Well, with traditional, you know, like missile treaties, uh, it was simple to prevent, you know, the U.S. will not have more than X number of missiles that can it's a reach number. more than you X can, range. Right, you can count well, the, them, yeah. Part, part of the problem is that, for example, cyber attacks coming from China to the U.S., it's not always possible to prove which ones are initiated by the governments and which ones are initiated by private citizens who are just doing it for whatever. Or, or initiated by somebody in the United States who just has controls of a bunch of desktops and servers in China through exactly. malware. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so because not all the actions can necessarily be attributed to the country that they appear to be coming from, it causes some problems. Right? You can't have uh, any... You can't basically say that just because it came from your country, it's your fault anymore. Right. Which, is, which you could do with missiles. <laughs> the other thing that's going to be talked about at this conference you mentioned is the establishment in the UK of a cyber hub at one of the country's leading universities, which will provide guidance to the government and companies about where to invest money for initiatives in cyberspace abroad. Well, it's good to have, um, you know, the government accepting advice from outside. Very true. It's the, the group it needs to be a mix, right? You need academics and you need people with industry experience, yeah. but you don't want those people to just be from big corporations. Yeah. Oh, boy. Right? Yeah. Everybody needs to kind of have a say in this. Yeah. And if, if all the advice comes from big corporations that can afford lobbyists or only from, you know, your uh, academics that are not living necessarily in the real world, then you don't always get the best yeah, advice. Yeah, they're in a little more theory, yeah. Yeah, and so, well, in theory, that works. In the real world, it might not. But the problem is that all the advice they get mostly comes from companies that have an agenda. Yeah, and a product to sell. The uh, the the best result for the internet for the citizens is not the goal, and that's the problem. Amen to that. And uh, and the case I'll be making on Unfilter is I think, you know, we're, we really are seeing the establishment of a new generation of the military-industrial complex. And it's going to be a worldwide one. And uh, anyways, 
I have we have more roundup stories to get to. So uh, why don't we talk about uh, some bad news for Oracle? <laughs> it's just <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, so uh, there's the DerbyCon 2.0 conference where where a security expert and uh, and his buddies demonstrating just demonstrating quote unquote hacking the Oracle client where they demonstrate that although Oracle does save usernames and passwords for the database client uh, in an encrypted form in the client's main memory, this data remains in memory after the session has ended and can easily be decrypted. A Trojan, for example, could exploit this to harvest the plain text passwords from the client, which was impressively demonstrated in real time during the conference. Yep. <laughs> Why would it keep it in memory like that? Even after well, you close you the client. It, it's just not being cleared out properly. But Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I also question whether it, the password when stored in memory there is actually encrypted or if it's just obfuscated. Uh, especially if they're cracking it that quickly. You know, if it was strong encryption, then it would be hard to crack. The problem would be, um, if the strong encryption is in memory, then the key is probably there as well, and then you just steal the key and you can decrypt it. Totally. Right? It's, it's the problem with storing passwords, right? Uh, when, you want, when you, you know, have it set so that you check a box and say, remember my password, there's no real secure way to make it remember your password forever. Yeah. Right? We talked about that a little bit, yeah. And, uh, you know, technically, if there's a Trojan on your computer, they could just key log you typing in the password even if you didn't remember the password. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, all right. So uh, why don't we talk about another conference? Supposedly, what Slashdot is titled the most important meeting you've never heard of. In December, the nations of the world will gather at Dubai in the UN uh, uh, World Conference on International Telecommunications uh, Junket. Pronounced wicket, by the way. The topic of the meeting is nothing less than the regulation of the internet, the article goes on to say. Under the auspicious... Uh, under the auspicious auspices, aus- whatever, of the International Telecommunications Union, the governments of the world will review the international treaty known as the International Tele- Telecommunications Regulations, ITR for short. The uh, last review of ITR was in 1998 when the internet was just beginning. The remarkable and reshaping growth of the internet provides the excuse for the new review. What's really afoot, however, is an effort by some nations to rebalance the internet in their favor by instituting telecom regulatory concepts from the last century. I think we've talked a little bit about this, where they think... Yes, that, like uh, where countries want to be able to charge a tax if the bytes go through their country and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gosh. Ah. Uh, the internet just breaks down breaks down nation barriers. And so let's, 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 let's put some artificial ones in there that are just regulatory-based, right? Isn't that what they're saying yeah. here? Yeah, it's all kinds of silliness. It's just a way to get trade money. Because... Uh, I mean, yeah, well, it's a way for governments to get control of the internet, and they shouldn't have it. Yeah, I guess it's both, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's talk about this story. Angela actually asked me about this. Facebook denies leaks of users' private messages. The CBC, among others, reporting that Facebook spokesperson is denying reports of private messages sent by users on the social networking site have been made public. Did you follow yes. this at all? Uh, yeah, uh, specifically the follow-up story that came out, I think, today. Uh, it turns out that no, no private messages were ever leaked. The Part of the problem was that with the timeline thing, a bunch of messages from way back, like 2007 and older, uh, which were wall-to-wall messages, so when you went and wrote on someone's wall, uh, they would show up on your public profile page as because those messages always were public, but some people thought they were private. Yeah. Uh, so just because they hadn't seen them on their page and all of a sudden they were there, they thought that... But basically... The concepts of the way you communicate were a lot different in the original right. versions of Facebook. Right. Uh, and so these messages, which were like quasi-private, didn't really fall under, you know, publicly posted on my page or private message. And they were kind of in between. And so some people misunderstood when they saw really old messages pop up again. Um, it's, but, uh, yeah. It's, it's actually an so, understandable uh, confusion. An, a company that does like privacy audits from France uh, went through it and found that no no data that shouldn't have been exposed was actually exposed, but that Facebook should increase the um, the help section and the tutorials about their privacy settings because people don't necessarily understand them. Oh, I guess I got the date wrong on that last or the last time that uh, important meeting uh, to discuss their internet regulation was in 1988, not 1998. That make, does make a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we all think of the data centers like Google's 100,000 server quote, where they must be these massive things. that It'd take almost a nuclear bomb to knock these things down. That's not always the case, is it, Alan? Yeah, um, so Level 3, which is one of the uh, biggest transit providers on the Internet. Uh, oh, yeah. 
the, we kind of we talked a little bit about them. They have that really impressive map from the other week. Mm-hmm. Uh, on their blog, they talk about how squirrels account for about 17% of all cable damage <laughs> to their whole network. Love this story. And that includes parts of the network that are underwater. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Uh, well, no, the squirrels aren't chewing the cables that are underwater, but 70% of, 17% of all damage is done by squirrels. And since squirrels can only damage the cables ah. that are exposed, right, right. that's a significant number. Now, that's not... Uh, that's mostly probably fiber optic cables, but also copper and, and so forth. Squirrel! Uh, apparently, also, squirrels are responsible for a large portion of power failures as well. Squirrel crash. I was trying to think of like a, like a, is it like a, a, squirrel, a squirrel outage? What do you call that? I was yeah. trying to get a title out of it somehow. That's pretty funny. And That's basically, funny. that story led me to another blog post at level three where they talked about. Uh, 10 of the most bizarre cable cuts they had ever run into. Like, uh, they say their network is 57,000 miles of intercity and 27,000 miles of metro fiber. Uh, and, you know, they have all kinds of above ground and underground paths and so on. <laughs> uh, but the biggest pain, the most common cause of fiber cuts uh, come from construction companies using excavators to dig in the ground and not oh, call for sure. it before they dig and oh, for sure. you know cutting giant trunks of cable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the number two cause is squirrels. <laughs> that is really so, funny. I never uh, knew. I mean, it makes sense, I guess. Uh, it seems the, the year before last, uh, squirrels accounted for 28%. But, <laughs> uh, because that was so high, they started uh, adding uh, cable guards and so on to prevent the squirrels from being able to get to the cables. <laughs> When squirrels attack. Uh, and of course, Mother Nature, you know, you got floods, uh, plane you know, crash, fires, I like that one. wind, even mudslides, hurricanes, ice storms. Ice storms can be really bad. Uh, but also, you know, somebody... This is pretty good. This is a good list here, Alan. I like this. Uh, there was one where there was a um, landslide and it, a river kind of in, injected itself in the middle of a cable route and they tried a couple of different things like using a boat to try to pull the cable across the ravine and they ended up having to shoot it across with a line gun <laughs> like you would expect from like Batman or something yeah yeah <laughs> like to climb a building <laughs> love it so Alan's got a Alan's got a or, you with, know of... trucks running into uh, telephone poles and taking out a 20 foot section of Ooh. broken telephone pole I love that level 3 has put this up on their site that's awesome it's, uh, you, never, you never know, right? You never know. Like when your internet goes down, it could have been related to a squirrel. Perhaps you are suffering from a squirrel outage. You just, so just take a deep breath. Next time your internet goes down and be like, they can't, you know what? Comcast can't do anything about squirrels. Yep. Comcast might be Comcastic, but they can't do anything about squirrels. But they have uh, some you know, vandalism, uh, people shooting at cables. Uh, what a stupid thing to shoot at. Why would you do that? Or, you know, airplane crashing into phone poles. Uh, I like that one. I like the airplane crashing because, like, again, that's like, well, what are you going to do? You know, some tree limbs falling down and, and taking out the cables, you know. Yeah. Same yeah. with ice and so on. But Now, uh, we have... Uh, uh, there was one time was one of our field managers about two miles inland and he spotted a three-foot-long shark in one of the cable <laughs> trenches. A shark? Yes. <laughs> oh, he's got a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a freaking shark right there. So uh, what caused the outage this morning? Uh, the shark got in the uh, conduit. Damn it. it. Two miles inland. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that shark really made a go for it. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how, yeah, I wonder, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm pull, I pulled up a larger version of it. It looks, gosh, that shark looks like it's three foot long maybe? Yeah, that's what they said. Oh, okay. That's too funny. This yeah. kind of fits in with the next story, too. Yeah, uh, this one was sent to me, and uh, it's a it's called Server Room Nightmares, and it's mostly security video yeah. of bad things happening in data centers. From a guy standing on a chair with wheels and trying to put a server in the top part of a rack, and the chair slips out, and the server falls down, and it goes smack, uh, to one where 
you know, uh, a, a <gasps> electrical oh. panel catches on fire and they keep putting it out and it keeps. Oh my gosh. Out. Yeah, I'm watching that one right now. Uh, uh, there's one where they have um, the fire extinguishers or rather the, the tanks that hold the fire stuff that they spray when the fire alarm goes off. One of them just exploded, sending shrapnel all over the place and flooding the room with the fire retardant. Yeah. What a mess. Which is like a fine dust that makes a mess of your servers. Talk about worst case scenario And there. triggering the power <laughs> shutdown, right? Because when there's a fire, you normally purposely shut off the power. But when the fire extinguisher exploded, it set off the fire alarm and <laughs> killed all the power to all the servers. This is pretty great, actually. This is, uh, oh man, they just put up a full screen ad. I'm sitting here watching the video and the site tosses up a full screen ad. Talk about no class. But there's also one, uh, some floods, a flash flood floods a data center. <laughs> The water's coming up and it like pops the, the the removable tiles under the floor and like the water starts coming up into the servers. Uh, there's one where there's like water shooting through a hole in the wall. I'm guessing a pipe burst or something and it was flooding the server room. I love this. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the, uh, oh man. Get out of there, dude. Get out of there. There's, those are some bad fumes. It's, it's funny to watch people's reactions too. This is a good yep. one to watch. We can't go through all of them, but I, I seriously could probably spend a couple hours watching this stuff. It's, it's it's partially painful. It's kind of like when you watch Ameri- uh, Funniest Home Videos and they and they keep getting height in the crotch. Yeah, it's like you kind of like watching it, but it's oh my gosh, this must be the water one. What is this? Smoke. So there you go. All right, we will put the. I'll, the chat room is asking for the link right now, so I will put a link if you're watching live. There you go, chat room. You can go watch the uh, seven worst nightmares. Um, pretty. That's that's a pretty good roundup. Do you remember who sent that in yep. to you? Uh, that one was uh, Bunny from the chat room. Tracy. Well, thank you, Bunny. That's that one is sort of satisfying to watch because it didn't happen to us. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it was basically uh, somebody else's war story for yeah, one. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Alan. I think that's it. I think that's the whole yep. show, isn't it? It is. All right, everyone. Well, uh, I just mentioned the live chat room. You can watch us live at jblive.tv at one p.m. Pacific, usually, except for next week. At next week, we will be starting at 11 a.m. Pacific. Which uh, What time is that, Eastern there, Alan? 2 p.m. 2 p.m., and you remember what the UTC is? That would be 1,600 UTC instead of 1,800. No. There you go. Sorry. There you go. What? Hold on. 1,800 instead of 2,800. Okay, 1,800 UTC. And uh, you can join us live at jblive.tv for the video version or jblive.info if you want the audio version for uh, sitting at the desk at the office or commuting or whatever it might be. We have two different versions of the stream over there, uh, 128 kilobit and 64 kilobit for you mobile users. So there you go. Links to everything we talked about will be found in the show notes. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Look for episode 78. You'll find the video. Then scroll down a little bit. You see download links and then boom, boom show notes with all the stuff that Alan talked about, including show notes. including uh, some of those discussion threads where you can get uh, your input and uh, things like that. All right, Alan. Well, thank you for the great show, sir. No problem. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning to this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week.